short, can we take some questions? So Gemma? So does anyone have an initial question or comment or anything they'd like to add? First? Okay, I, I have an initial question. So we've talked a lot about globalization and MDGs and literacy and numeracy and testing. How do you, do you think values get lost or even eliminated through excessive competitiveness and testing so that actually people cannot develop those things like empathy if you're constantly tested to compete with others. Yeah, I, th I think there is definitely a risk of that. And I think, you know, it goes back to uh, what the keynote speaker was saying this morning about are we measuring what we treasure? And, you know, is, is, is what we want for people to be more competitive and to, 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 to beat everybody else and to win? Or, or do we actually want to teach people how to collaborate and how, how to have empathy and how to live cooperatively and how, how to actually relate to the natural world in a way that doesn't destroy it? I think in, in many ways the, the educational paradigm that the, the policy makers certainly are still in is, is very much the, this kind of competition and dominance and trying to be the best. And to, you know, the, the, school, the, the pupils are in competition with one another and the schools are in competition with one another and to some extent even countries are in competition with one another. And you've still got GDP as the, the kind of number one indicator that everyone looks to as, as a measure of country's success, which means basically that the more economic activities you have, whether or not they're, they're positive in the sense of helping people to, to live peacefully with each other and with the environment, the, the more you do, you know, the, the more bombs you manufacture and the more, the more guns you manufacture, the better you, the, the, the further you climb up the rankings. And so yeah, I think that there are some big underlying issues here. And you know, that, that may be a barrier to actually developing the, these kinds of values-based indicators. I think it, it will be interesting to see to what extent sustainability and education for sustainable development get completely co-opted by the kind of green growth, you know, corporate agenda, and to what extent there is still more kind of connection, and it's more about connectedness and sustainability in the, in the sense of long-term interconnectedness, the way that perhaps some indigenous communities might understand it. So, so yeah, I think that, that, that's a really important point. It's a, it's a huge problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I was going to be... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's interesting, actually. I'm, I'm thinking about the idea of indicator and what uh, get measured get done. Mm. But then that uh, would put lots of nation, countries, whatever it is, focusing their activities on these measures, or on these measures, so they can have, because we have this table that say, oh, X achieved this, this, achieved that. Mm -hmm. So everybody will be working just to focus on that indicator. And then you came with the, the idea saying that, no, let's make it local and context specific, and let people tell us what they value. But then we, we kind of like in, in between, these are too focused, and what you what you you try to say is it's kind of an approach that you have to, to create different varieties of of things that we have around, and then also it's going to get difficult to measure all these things as you go up to up the in the country level or in a nation level, whatever it is. So my, my question is, would it be where, where do we draw the line? Where do we stand, either in this camp or that camp, or should we stand in a camp as well? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, what, what I'm saying here obviously is quite radical in, in relation to the Millennium Development Goals and the sort of very top-down quantitative numerical goals. And um, with these indicators, there's no reason why they can't be made more rigorous and more quantitative. It really just depends who, who's interested in them and, who, and who's looking at them. So, you know, there, there is no reason in principle why you couldn't have some sort of values related goal at the national level based on, for example, people, you know, teachers feel that such and such is, is, is working well, or pupils feel that such and such is working, and to have surveys that, that would generate quantitative data for that indicator. So I, I don't think it has to be a rigid either or, but I can see that they are somehow pulling in different directions, that if, if, if people are very focused on trying to make everybody able to read, write and count to a minimum national standard, and that is what all the resources being poured into, then inevitably you're going to lose some of the empathy and some of the connection to nature and some of the you know, recognition of, of cultural traditions and indigenous knowledges. 
and you know, it, it's. I'm not saying everybody should go out and start protesting against the Millennium Development Goals, but you know, obviously there is a, a sort of a balance to be struck, and I think it's, a, it's something for people to reflect on. Sustainability keeps getting bandied around, but when all these other goals are being set, are we going to actually lose genuine sustainability in the process? Yeah, I have a linked question. I'm really interested in what you're doing, Gemma. It links so much with what I'm interested in my own research. Um, I'm doing research on citizenship education and education rights, mm. and particularly the interpretation of education rights, and it comes back to a lot of these like, indicators, yeah. this mm. idea that these things are sort of decided in the top and then they're meant to trickle down, but actually yeah. these indicators or even rights that can look very different in different contexts. And I suppose also linking back to what Sajad was saying, like, it, I, I find, I'm finding it so difficult because people have so many different interpretations of various terms. Mm. Um, for example, we were talking last night actually about the term relevance. So what, it, what is a relevant mm. education? What's a relevant citizenship education? I mean, that can mean so many different things. Yeah. And in some ways it can mean totally opposite things. So for some people, a relevant citizenship education, for example, in a divided context might be it's relevant if it's teaching you to accept someone who's different from you, for example. For someone else, a relevant citizenship education might be one that's teaching you to be very nationalistic and believe in your own particular mm -hmm. identity that might yeah. actually go against the identities of other people in the community. So I guess I don't really have a question, it's just more... <laughs> <laughs> I'm swimming in my own data and trying to work out, you know, if we can't agree on these things, like what? Yeah, I, th I think I, I found this, this um, triangle quite useful. Like, I, I came across this triangle actually in semiotics, which is the study of yeah. symbols. Yeah. And it's a very, very old concept, this, this formulation of it, of symbol, and this one was called thought or belief, and this one was called reference. And that, that came from actually the 1920s, oh. uh, research on semiotics. But applying it to values is, is our um, innovation at University of Brighton. But we've, um, so the idea that the, the word and the actual real world behaviours are not the same thing for starters. You, you can have a word, but everybody in their head will have a different meaning associated with it. They, they won't necessarily overlap at all because everybody's meanings will be based on experience. Yeah. And so the first thing that you have to do, really, if you want to work with that word, is try to get some kind of a shared understanding within the group of, of you know, OK, we, we accept that you all came from different places, you all have different experiences, you all understand equality in different ways. But can we just create a working definition that we all agree that, you know, A, B and C will be included? And I think, you know, through that, you can then translate that. This, this kind of goes backwards and forwards between the, the shared meaning and then what you actually use to, as indicators to, to show that you've got equality or whatever it is. Because once everybody's on the same page in terms of what it means, then you, you can start to create indicators. But it's, it's, it's obviously, the, the, further, the higher up you get in any kind of hierarchy, the harder it gets. You, you can do this very easily in small NGOs. It gets a bit harder when you're working with kind of big bureaucratic NGOs. And it, it would get harder still to try and scale it up to the national level. But I, I still believe it could be done. I mean, they're just very optimistic, but <laughs> this certainly raises the, the basic question about um, involving all range of stakeholders in mm. any kind of decision making process in this kind of thing, or even in developing human rights law. I mean, it has to include the people that are meant to be fulfilling these laws. That's right. I mean, I, I've done some work on female genital mutilation in Tanzania, and uh, there's been an effort to present it as a human rights issue. If, if you talk to the local community, they construct it as a human rights issue from a completely different perspective, as in our right to have our, to not have our culture interfered with, and for all these the, these well-meaning foreigners to clear up and go home and let, and let us get on with our initiation. And so, you know, we, come, we we found the human rights perspective actually wasn't very helpful in that case. And what did work was for people to actually come forward and reflect on their on their negative experiences of FGM, people from within the community, and say, well, actually, you know. This, this is what it meant, this is what it was for, but we, we think there are actually other better ways of, of reaching those same goals. And so, you know, the, any, anything like human rights, if, if it's not kind of coming from the local perspective, it, it can be very difficult to, to translate into ground level. Mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the big, it comes back to what um, you were saying earlier about um, 
Mozambique uh, with, the, with the teenage pregnancy, you know, that people have different as the assumptions that people think that, that the um, policy is based on, and not necessarily the assumptions that people will have at the, at the village level. So, you know, it's just probably makes research a whole lot harder and <laughs> makes policy making harder still, but it's just, just kind of throwing a spanner in the, in the MGG works here and playing devil's advocate a bit and saying, well, actually, you know, are you missing something? Uh, it's, a, it's just out of curiosity. You said that this is an ongoing research, isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, what is the final outcome that you are planning to get? Is it a report on what it's the, the, the things that should be valued or it's measured? Yeah. Well, what? Specifically for the Pearl project, we're trying to get a toolkit that secondary school teachers can use. And with two toolkits, actually, one of them to assess how they think their students are doing in relation to the values that underlie education for sustainability. And so it's, it's a toolkit to help secondary school teachers think about what their students are achieving, different ways of assessing students. And then the other one is for them to think about the learning environment and for, for school administrators really to think to what extent does our school support education for sustainability. So that, that's the outputs from our particular working group mm. within the Pearl Project. I mean, the, the, the bigger research agenda is, is trying to look at values-based indicators in different contexts, um, trying to get into the SDGs debate, which is, is not always easy. We've got a paper that we're trying to write for the journal Sustainability at the moment, and we had lots of um, positive comments, but also lots of quite negative ones, and, uh, you know, oh, you have, you've missed out this entire literature, and you've missed out that entire literature, and you, sh you should be looking at so-and-so. So that that's um, what we're trying to do, is sort of get values more onto the international sustainability agenda, I guess you could say, is, is the broader goal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think this is great, and especially um, in my research is more in armed conflict and mm. displacement community. I think this would work great in that type of setting because it is um, neglected so much in the MDGs, it's it's I mean, it's, it's a huge issue, um, and I think it would be very meaningful to go into communities and try to maybe do like some sort of work with what they value and, and since they're they're oftentimes um, so marginalized in their own communities mm -hmm. themselves. So I find it very interesting. Yeah, agree. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think you know there's massive potential in sort of post-conflict situations if you could actually go into two previously warring communities and create a set of indicators and, no, and the, the people looking at it wouldn't know which side the indicators had come from and they'd actually realise that they all valued the same things when it came down to it. That, that could be an amazing kind of tool for transformation. Right. Um, I mean, if, if you wanted to kind of explore how you might use it, the, the, um, the indicators, of, the, the, the first set of indicators that we developed are freely available um, on, I, I, can, I think I put the website at the end. Um, oops. Ah. Let's find the last slide. Uh, there's a website called wevalue.org, which is the output from the initial two-year European Union funded project. And anyone can sign up on that and create a profile. And once, once you've created a profile, you can log in and see all the indicators. You can download ones that are interesting to you. You can change the wording. You can print them out. You can look at case studies and do all sorts of things. And it's all completely free. So that, that, that's for anyone to use that, that is interested in pursuing this is not the education indicators, this is the previous set which were from civil society organisations. The education ones are still a work in progress. But there are still some that would be relevant anyway. Okay, I think we we'll have to call the time there. But thanks, Gemma. That was Thank you. Really cool. We've now got time for some drinks and more networking before the, uh, the workshop. Thank you.